It's resulting in disrupted weather, massive heat waves, extended droughts, extreme storms, amplified hurricanes, warming ocean temperatures, death of coral reefs. We're at a tipping point. We're watching species that are being pushed out of their range, going extinct. The debate is over. Global warming is real, and its impacts are being felt around the world right now. We're standing in Empire, Louisiana. Um, this used to be a residential neighborhood. Uh, we're backing up. The Mississippi River is beyond a levee that's just beyond those trees. What you see here, these cars, ruined houses, oil in the water, goes on for miles in both directions. Hurricanes feed on warm water. As global warming is increasing sea temperatures and the ocean is trapping the heat of the sun more readily, hurricanes have more fuel to feed them. This is resulting, scientists say, in bigger and fiercer storms that carry more wind, more rain, and more damage. Global temperatures are at the hottest they've been in probably 2,000 years or more. The 1990s were the hottest decade ever recorded. 2005 was the hottest year ever recorded. And the first half of 2006 is hotter still. If we don't cap global emissions of greenhouse gas pollution, global temperatures will continue to increase, causing irreparable damage to ecosystems around the world. Both poles are indeed experiencing more warming than the mid-latitudes. So the Arctic is kind of a bellwether for the impacts of global warming. The Arctic is warming faster than the rest of the planet. The first sign of this is the shrinking ice pack over the ocean, the Arctic Ocean. And it's shrinking at record rates. 2005 was the, the smallest amount of ice in the summer ever recorded. The Arctic sea ice and the Greenland meltdown have global significance because the water that's contained in there, if it's flushed into the Atlantic, for example, uh, will change the ocean temperatures and could disrupt currents in the Arctic Ocean considerably, throwing off the climate of all of Europe, for example. Greenpeace explorers Lonnie Dupree and Eric Larson made the first summer journey to the North Pole to draw attention to the impacts of global warming on the Arctic. When our grandkids uh, are our age, if we don't do something about global warming, this will be gone, and who's going to tell them about it? Seeing these dramatic changes firsthand is uh, disheartening. The entire Earth's climate is connected. If we mess with one part, other parts are affected. And the Arctic is a key cog in that wheel. 
The polar bears rely on this ice to make their living. They go out on the ice to hunt for their prey and get fat for the winter. And uh, the mother bears have to gain enough weight to raise and wean their young. With shrinking sea ice, they have to sometimes swim 50 miles or more to get to the ice edge where the seals are, where they eat. So without sea ice, there will be no polar bears. Scientists already point to the fact that by mid-century, by 2050, polar bears could be pushed to the brink of extinction by global warming. Greenland holds a tremendous quantity of the world's fresh water in the form of ice that's many thousands of feet thick. Scientists are now tracking that the glaciers that run off of Greenland into the ocean are speeding up, dumping more of that ice into the ocean. It's basically melting down. This has been predicted for a long time by climate scientists that as the Earth warms, this ice sheet could, be, could reach a tipping point. Indeed, if Greenland melts completely, ocean levels, sea levels around the world could rise by 20 feet, some seven meters. This would inundate low-lying cities like Washington, D.C., for example, and cause tremendous damage to coastal regions around the world. We have a chance to stop the runaway train and put the brakes on if we cap emissions now. It's a daunting prospect, but the solutions are not only available, they're everywhere. They're as natural as the wind and the sun. Wind energy can actually provide worldwide 30% of the electricity needs. Denmark gets 20% of its energy generation from wind power. In certain places at certain times, wind provides 100% of the electricity generation in that country. The number one producing country is actually Germany. And if you take Spain, for example, they produce about 8% of their electricity from wind, and it's projected to be about 15% by 2020. President Bush himself has said that we can generate up to 20% of our electricity from wind power in this country. Right now we have 100,000 megawatts, or the equivalent of 2.5 million average American homes are powered by wind energy. And so it's quite a significant amount, but we do need to keep in mind that it is still less than 1% of the energy that we produce in this country. As demand for wind power has increased, costs have come down. In the best locations, wind power can compete for costs with gas and coal. Because wind energy is growing at such a rapid rate, we will see up to 2 million jobs worldwide come online due to clean local energy. And in this country, a significant number of those will be in both construction and the actual building of the turbines, as well as maintenance for the facilities. But it isn't just wind. Solar cells are now used to harness the sun's energy in a wide range of consumer products, including watches, calculators, and toys. They are small and easy to install anywhere there's available light. States are leading the way with a vacuum in federal leadership on global warming and renewable energy policy. California, Arizona, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey have all passed great laws to install new renewable energy and investing billions of dollars in new solar power. In 2006, solar company Sun Edison announced plans to develop the world's largest solar project in Nevada. If these trends continue, by 2040, solar power could be responsible for generating 16% of the world's electricity. It's all part of a growing alternative energy revolution. But while states, cities, and college campuses are taking action, Washington is dragging its feet. Which isn't particularly surprising, given the cozy relationship between government and the fossil fuel industry. Consider the case of Philip A. Cooney. In 2005, the New York Times reported that Cooney, chief of staff of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, had repeatedly edited government climate reports in ways that play down links between greenhouse gas emissions and global warming. Two days after the Times article was published, Cooney resigned his position and later that year took a new job with ExxonMobil. 
Before he joined the White House, Cooney was a lobbyist for the American Petroleum Institute. No wonder, then, that the federal government has its head in the sand on global warming. But the tide is turning, and you can help. Global warming is such a serious threat that we need action now. And that action is going to come from our government, Congress. And so one way that people can get involved is to join with Greenpeace. We are running a campaign called Project Hot Seat, and it's to put global warming on the front burner. It's time for politicians to feel the heat. This October, we're making 10,000 calls to voters in key congressional districts. And we need your help to make that happen. Go here to sign up for a shift to make calls from the comfort of your own home. Between us, we will mobilize the American public to send climate champions to Congress. For years, the fossil fuel industry has insisted that renewable energy cannot help us uh, to replace our energy needs. That's being proven not true. Wind power is the fastest growing source of electricity. It's cheaper than ever, and it's being installed at record rates along with solar power. So clearly we're at the crest of an energy revolution. Renewable energy is taking over, and it's the only hope really to solve global warming.